Hello, everyone. Welcome, students of APSC 132 from Queen's University. This is Professor Rasmussen. You can call me Professor Raz. And today we're going to be talking about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, of course, if you look at the literal meaning of the word, means the flow of heat. So we're going to look at how heat flow and work, two forms of energy, interrelated, are interrelated, and, and how they affect certain systems. So let's go over some of the definitions that you're going to need to know. We're going to talk about a system, which is a collection of material we choose to examine. Could be the inside of a calorimeter. Could be the inside of a turkey in an oven. The surroundings are everything outside of that system. And together, the system and the surroundings make up the universe. Now, here is a diagram, a simple diagram showing a <clears throat> system and the surroundings. And together, there is the universe. And of course, the system and surroundings are separated by some kind of boundary. So let's be a little more specific now. The system could be anything. It could be a potato cooking in a boiling water. It could be a chemical reaction occurring inside the cylinder of a car engine. It could be the coolant in the coils of a freezer. Now, the internal energy is the sum of the internal kinetic and potential energies of the particles in the system. So the system's particles are moving around. The rate at which they're moving around depends on how much energy they have. <clears throat> and heat is simply a measure of how that energy can be transferred from a hot body to a cold body. When you place two objects together at different temperatures, they will transfer heat by colliding with each other. Now let's look at this system here. This is a turkey inside an oven. We're gonna be cooking the turkey. So the system is the actual turkey and the surroundings are the inside of the oven. Now the energy is being transferred, of course, from electricity is converted into heat or unless you're using a wood burning stove, then the uh, energy coming from the burning the wood would be the energy source. That energy source is being transferred into the turkey. So the energy is going from the oven to the turkey. Now what's happening to the uh, internal energy, delta U in the turkey? Think about it. Heat is going into the turkey from the oven. So energy, it must be going up. The molecules inside the turkey are increasing. Now let's talk about different systems we can use to actually capture heat and measure quantities of heat involved in various interactions. What I'm showing here is a uh, ice calorimeter. So this ice calorimeter is filled with ice. No water, just ice. And the system in this case would be some kind of reaction happening inside here, inside the ice calorimeter. It could be a chemical reaction. It could be burning something in there. <clears throat> now the surroundings, if the system is where the actual chemical reaction is happening, the surroundings in this case would be the ice water mixture here. Even though we start out, it's just ice in here. Now, where is the energy being transferred? It's being transferred from the system to the ice. Now, what's happening when that happens? Well, heat energy from the system is being used to cause a change in the state of the ice. The ice will be changing into water. So we can indirectly measure how much heat was involved using the heat of fusion of ice. We know how much energy it takes to heat up ice. So as the ice melts, we know that ice is less dense than water. How do we know that? Well, we know it because ice floats on top of water, it takes up more space. When those hydrogen bonds kick in, water molecules actually get stuck further apart in ice. 
as opposed to in water, the uh, molecules can kind of get closer together. So as the ice melts, it actually causes a decrease in volume. So that, de that volume change can be measured by looking at how much water actually leaves this column here. That's, we can measure with a measuring device, a ruler. You can call this a manometer if you want, if you want. And then we can measure it. And that's how we can indirectly determine how much energy was involved in this system. So the ice bath traps the energy released by the system and its internal energy increases. So the internal energy of the system, in this case, if it was an exothermic process, would be releasing heat energy. That heat energy is being used to melt the ice. So does the internal energy of the system increase or decrease? It must be decreasing. And how is the heat measured? It's measured by looking at how much water has flowed in to take the place of the ice that is melted. So we can measure the height of this water column change over time. And that's one ingenious way we can use to measure energy changes inside a, a system. So systems can be considered to be open or closed. An open system are systems whose boundaries permit the flow of matter into and out of the system. So in this case, we have a furnace. We have reactants in the, in the form of natural gas, let's say, and the natural gas is being burned and the heat is being removed from that oven or from that furnace and the heat is flowing. Uh, what's carrying that heat? You're going you're gonna to turn on a fan and the fan is going to blow over that combustion chamber here. And we're also going to remove the products of that combustion. If it's a really good furnace, we should be producing mostly carbon dioxide and water, but you're probably going to produce a little bit of carbon monoxide if there's a little bit of incomplete combustion going on so the products flow out. <clears throat> now, air, like I said, we're going to push air over that combustion chamber to maintain the temperature of the system. So the reaction is isothermal. Why is that? Well, if the heat was allowed to keep building up, the furnace would actually melt eventually. So a fan kicks in and the fan will start blowing air over that combustion chamber and the air is going to carry out the heat. And in this chemical system, again, as I mentioned, it would be the fuel, natural gas, which is mainly methane, CH4. Methane is combining with oxygen in the air, and it's making CO2 and H2O. <clears throat> now, if the fan does go off for any reason, then the furnace has to shut down because you would, could have a meltdown of the furnace and potentially burn your house. So we certainly don't want that to happen. <clears throat> so there's a built-in safety measure there. Now, closed systems are systems that are impermeable to the flow of matter in and out. For instance, a thermos bottle, a good thermos bottle that you buy that keeps liquids hot or cold for long periods of time would be classified as a closed system. Nothing goes in or out, including heat. Now, what is the best insulator there? Well, you have a near vacuum in between two layers. And as long as you have very few molecules present, the ability to transfer heat is certainly diminished because heat transfer is the result of particles colliding with one another and transferring some of their kinetic energy. Another example of a closed system could be the air inside an automobile tire. <clears throat> now here we're looking at a system here where we have, again, we have a container that is enclosed. We have heat transfer in or out. It looks like there's a piston here. So we can further explore this particular system. When we can see there's an external pressure operating on this piston, we're going to assume the piston is frictionless. And we have a, a system inside here in this chamber, and we can transfer heat to it. So <clears throat> now the gas below the piston is our system. The pin. A pin is placed in this system, 
as we heat it up to prevent the piston from moving. So as we heat up this gas, the particles of gas will start to move faster. They're gonna collide more frequently with the walls of the container. The pressure is gonna be going up. The volume in this case is constant in this container because the pin is there. Now, is this system open, closed, or isolated? What do you think? Now, this particular system right now is closed. Is heat going into or out of the system? Well, looks like heat is going into the chemical system. Now, <clears throat> would this cause the internal energy of the system to increase or decrease the heating of it? Well, remember I was saying, as you heat it up, the particles move faster. They collide more frequently with the walls of the container. In fact, obviously the delta U of the system, this gas inside this piston is increasing. <clears throat> now we're gonna pull that pin out. So as you can imagine, if we pull that pin out, you can see what happens. The internal pressure was greater than the external pressure. So there was a increase in volume until the external pressure was equal to the internal pressure. Now that gas has expanded. So the pressure of the system was greater than the pressure external, the piston went up. So work, physical work was being done by the system. So if heat is equal to the work in magnitude only, what happens to the temperature? Well, the temperature must remain constant because the heat in equals the work out. And we call this type of system an isothermal system, no change in temperature. <clears throat> now in this closed system, the heat transferring energy to the molecules in the system. So the internal energy U of the system must be increasing. So if the gas expands, however, that, that's what happened initially, but as the gas, ex, gas expanded, the work done by the system on the surroundings, the internal energy of those molecules must have decreased. That energy was used to push that piston up. The rate at which those molecules would be moving would have slowed down after that expansion. So when we added heat to the system and it was equal to the work done by the system, the temperature remained constant. If the temperature remains constant, the internal energy also remains constant. With no temperature change, not gonna have a change in internal energy of the system. Now let's look at how that energy can be uh, compared by using a simple mouse trap here. We all know a mouse trap has a spring in it. It's spring loaded. So <clears throat> as it is set, Describe that flow of energy. Well, energy is put into the system to set the trap. When it tries to catch the rat, describe the energy flow. Well, now the energy is flowing from the trap to the mouse as he tries to get the cheese. And unfortunately, the mouse is going to get captured or worse. So now the energy is flowing in the opposite direction. The stored energy is being released. The standard state of a substance we're gonna talk about right now. The standard states of substances by definition are the form that a substance takes at a pressure of 100 kilopascals, and we can specify it at a specific temperature. Typically, we specify it at 25 degrees Celsius. So the standard state of carbon at that pressure and temperature is not diamond, but it's coal. And we designate that a substance is in fact at a standard state by using a little degree sign. So delta H degree sign would indicate that that enthalpy change was measured at 100 kilopascals and a specific temperature, usually 25 degrees Celsius. So a thermodynamic state is a macroscopic state, which is a fancy word for saying, what can you see? that system? What can you observe about that system? So if a system is at e equilibrium, the macroscopic state is independent of time. It's not going to change over time if the system is at equilibrium. So each property of a system 
whether it be at equilibrium or not, is called a state function. And a state function could include things like pressure, temperature, volume, energy, and all these quantities. It does not matter how we arrived at those values. They are all state functions. It's independent of time. Doesn't matter how you arrive there. So state functions are always represented by capital letters, like temperature, pressure, internal energy, volume. A system is in a thermodynamic state when the system is in a state of equilibrium. So there's no changing, no changes being observed to the macroscopic properties of the system. Now, changes in state function indicate differences between the final and initial states. So for instance, a change in pressure means we just simply went from one pressure state to another pressure state. Doesn't really matter how you achieve that pressure state. The change will be independent. <clears throat> so if I wanted to try to explain the difference between a state function and a non-state function, I'm going to use a simple physics analogy for now. Now, in that physical, in the, in the uh, analogy I'm going to use, if we compare displacement to distance, distance is independent, is dependent on the path that was used, whereas displacement is not. Okay, I'm going to further talk about that some more. So when we have pressure changes in a state function, heat Changes are not state functions. So heat, a heat change would be like the distance traveled when you go from point A to point B. The displacement, however, is set. It doesn't matter on the path. If you go from point A to point B, it doesn't matter if you veer off path. If all we're concerned with is the difference between your initial position and your final position, that's displacement. Whereas distance is the path that you took. One is path dependent, non-state function is path dependent, and a state function like displacement is not path dependent. So I can show you with a simple series of diagrams here. So if we go from P1, a pressure state one to pressure state two, and then back to pressure state three, we can see that the change in pressure would be whatever you ended with, and whatever you started with. It doesn't matter that we actually went to a, a different pressure at P2 if all we're concerned with is the state from P1 to P3. It's independent of the path that we took. When we talk about heat, however, heat is dependent on the path. So if we use a certain amount of heat to get from one state to another, and then we use another quantity of heat to cause another change, we cannot calculate, in this case, delta Q. Because it's path dependent, we would have to add up both of those quantities of heat. Each step involved heat. So the total heat would be the sum of those two. Now, one could be positive, one could be negative. It doesn't really matter, depending on whether you added heat or took heat away. Now, another example I'm going to use to explain the difference between state functions and non-state functions is a ski hill. So if you take a look, the elevation at the top of this particular ski hill is 1,000 meters when you get off the chairlift. When you got on the chairlift, the elevation at the bottom of the ski hill was 200 meters. So a state function in this case would simply be the elevation change when you go from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom. So let's pretend two skiers get off at the top one skier decides to get warmed up and take a nice long trek home, the distance that they cover is gonna be much different than another skier who left at the same time and decides to just swish down the hill as fast as they can. So in this case, the elevation difference, the change in elevation would be the same for both skiers, but the distance traveled by the skier going down the easier route would be much greater than the distance traveled by the skier that just went straight down the mountain who's adequately warmed up and enjoys going at high speeds. Again, that's the difference. So again, 
Elevation change is a state function. It's independent of path. The distance traveled is not a state function. It depends on the path. And we can make the two equal by defining the path. If I stipulate that the only path you can take is to get on the chairlift at the bottom and go up the chairlift to the top, that uh, specification means now that those two quantities are equal, the distance traveled and the elevation will be identical because we have defined the path. And we're gonna use that uh, further in our discussions in thermodynamics when we set a non-state function equivalent to a state function, as long as we define the path, we can successfully calculate uh, uh, the, the change in the a state function using a non-state function. So the three laws of thermodynamics, the zeroth law of thermodynamics is really the first law of common sense. It concerns temperature. And the first law of thermodynamics concerns the conservation of energy, which we'll deal with a lot in this unit. We studied the first law of thermodynamics and you did in high school by using coffee cup calorimeters in most cases. Uh, when you used enthalpies of formation to figure out enthalpy changes in chemical reactions, we're gonna talk about how enthalpy is a special state function that was defined for a purpose. And when you used Hess's law to, when you use the sum of the uh, enthalpies of formation of the products minus the sum of the enthalpy of formation of the reactants equals the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction, you were using Hess's law. Or you could have used different steps in chemical reactions and added them up to calculate enthalpy change. If it's a state function, then it's independent of the steps that you take or the path. So you can use multiple chemical reactions added together or combined to arrive at the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. And that was something that you covered in high school. So the second law of thermodynamics, we'll deal with that in later lectures. It concerns enthalpy changes. Now the zeroth law, if the temperature A equals the temperature B and the temperature of A also equals the temperature of C, hopefully you can see where I'm going with this, then the temperature B must equal temperature C. That, that's just pure logic here. So the law in also involves thermal contact. These substances all have to be in thermal contact with each other, which means the particles have to be able to collide with one another. And the warmer substance will transfer its energy to the cooler substance. <clears throat> now, the first law of thermodynamics embodies the idea that energy is conserved when a process happens. That is, energy can be converted from one form to another, but the total amount of energy is constant. Fundamental principle. Now, it states that any change in the internal energy of a system not involving a physical or chemical change must equal the work done on the system plus the heat absorbed by the system. So, so delta U equals Q plus W is another way of stating this, where delta U is the internal energy and Q and W are in small case, uh, delta U is large case, Q and W are heat and work. So here is the equation that we use. Again, delta U, internal energy, the change in internal energy has to deal with the amount of heat that went into or out of the system, and the amount of work that was either done on or by the system. So the change in internal energy, of course, is the change in the kinetic energy of the molecules or the particles inside the system. It can be atoms. So it's a state function because it's independent of path. Q is the amount of heat that's released or absorbed. It's not a state function because it is path dependent. And work, again, is not a state function because it's dependent on the path. When you compress a gas, the amount of energy that you're using and the amount of work that you're doing depends on how the work is being applied. So it's, it is not a state function. So let's consider this closed system in here. We have molecules bounding around in here. In this case, it's a monatomic system, single atom particles. It's a volume, a state function is one liter. Its pressure, another state function, is 100 kilopascals. But we see the external pressure 
is only 33 kilopascals on this piston. So there's a pin holding it in place. Now, what happens when you remove the pin? Well, if we investigate, we can see the internal pressure of this closed system here is 100 kilopascals. The external pressure is only 33 kilopascals, however. So wouldn't you predict that the volume is going to increase? So we can see here, if we go from state one to state two, we can see that the gas is going to expand. And we can actually predict what, how much it will expand by knowing the initial volume and pressure. And we can graph it. We have what we call a PV graph, which we'll be using quite often in this course. We can see the initial pressure at state one was 100 kilopascals, and that gas changed volume. The volume actually increased. So the volume is on this axis. We can see the volume went from one liter to three liters. It followed this curve. Now, was work done on or by the system? So the system, again, are the particles inside here. Well, weren't they pushing on that piston? So the work was done by the system on the surroundings. So that type of work we can calculate by simply knowing the amount of volume change that's happened. So we're going to take the external pressure and because it's work being done by the system on the surroundings, that's negative work. We're gonna take the minus value of the external pressure, which originally, okay, was minus 33 kilopascals. We're gonna multiply by the change in volume from state one to state two, which was three liters to one liter. And the work total was 66 kilopascals. Now, how can we continue to expand the gas system? Well, you're gonna to have to change the pressure. So because this is an equilibrium right now, the pressure inside is the same as the pressure outside. We're not gonna add any more energy to it. We're gonna to have to lower the pressure. So let's lower the external pressure to 10 kilopascals. So if I'm a person that's pushing on this gas, I'm gonna push on the gas with less force. Now, when we do that, the gas is gonna expand until again, the internal pressure and the external pressure are equal again. So we now just went from state two to state three. The volume of the gas went from three liters to 10 liters. The pressure of the gas went from 33 kilopascals to 10 kilopascals. So now how can we calculate the work that was done? Well, we know the total work will be the work that was done to go from step from stage one to stage two. And the next amount of work that was done went from step two to step three. So the total work, we can use the equation twice. The original pressure was minus 33 kilopascals. The original volume change was two liters. The second pressure used was minus 10 kilopascals and the volume changed from 10 to three, so seven liters. So we got a total of 66, minus 66 kilopascal liters. Work done by the system is negative, added to minus 70 kilopascal liters. Now keep in mind, a kilopascal liter is equivalent to a joule. It, a joule is defined as a kilopascal liter. So we get the total. Now, if you look up R on your information sheet, and you should always have your information sheet by your side when solving problems, because that's what you're gonna be using when you're um, performing questions on quizzes and when you're solving questions on quizzes and, and midterm and final exam. So get used to that information sheet always being around you. Even during lectures, I, I uh, <clears throat> suggest that you have your information sheet by you at all times. R is, the, is a gas constant. It equals 8.31 kilopascal liters per mole Kelvin. Also on the information sheet, it shows you that you have a pressure of 8.31, which is the same pressure, but look at the unit difference. It's joules per mole Kelvin. Since the denominator is mole Kelvin in both instances, it must mean that the 8.31 kilopascal liters is the same as the 8.31 joules. So kilopascal must be equal to joule. 
So if you forget that fact, you can always use the information sheet to clarify that. Now work is done by the system on the surroundings. So the work, is it positive or negative? Think about it. Work is being done by the system, so it's a negative work. If it's done on the system, if we were squishing the gas, that would be a positive work. Because when work is done by the system, the system is losing internal energy. These particles are not going to be moving as fast after the work is done. And that's why we regard it as negative work. Now, Q heat and W work always depend on the path since they're non-state functions. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, more later on when we talk about different types of changes happening to gases. Now, internal energy is a state function, as we mentioned. Internal energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of the particles in the system. So it has to do with the particles in the system moving around. It also has to do with the dynamics inside those particles as well. The actual electrons moving around the nucleus, all that contributes to the internal energy of a, of a substance. Now the kinetic energy consists of the molecular motions and the motions of the electrons within the molecules. And of course we have the potential energy as mentioned, which is the interaction between the electrons and the nuclei. And if they're inside a, an atom, we call them intramolecular or inside a molecule, it's intramolecular. If they're between the molecules, we call them intermolecular bonds. For instance, when water freezes, goes from a liquid to a solid, it's because of the intermolecular forces taking over between the water molecules. When we actually chemically destroy water and separate it into hydrogen and oxygen, which is a difficult thing to do, it requires quite a bit of energy, but we are overcoming intramolecular forces in water molecules. Going the opposite direction is also possible. We can take H hydrogen gas and combine it with oxygen gas in a combustion, releasing energy. And again, we're overcoming the forces of attraction inside those hydrogen molecules and inside those oxygen molecules. Because remember, they're both diatomic. Hydrogen gas is H2, oxygen gas is O2. Let's talk about heat now. We said it's not a state function, which means... <clears throat> that the energy transferred from a hot body to a cold body when the two are placed in thermal contact is really a measure of energy flow. Now an exothermic process, which most of you are familiar with, is the heat generated and transferred from a system to its surroundings. So a lot of the processes that run the modern world are exothermic, when you think about it. The fuels we burn in our vehicles, the fuels we burn in, in airplanes, they release tremendous amounts of energy that are being utilized to perform work for us and to actually heat us up. Now, internal energy of the system decreases during an exothermic process. Now, if a reaction does take place in a calorimeter, we can trap that heat energy and use it to calculate the energy change by looking at either the temperature rising or dropping. Now, an endothermic process is where heat is transferred from the surroundings to the system. And this causes the internal energy to, of course, increase because we're getting a transfer from the surroundings into the system. For instance, if you were to take an ice pack and break it open, the old ice packs we used to use were ammonium nitrate and water, and the surroundings would get cold. And I know it's not intuitive, but if you think about it, the surroundings got cold because energy was being transferred into that chemical system that was, that was inside that bag. And so the surroundings got very cold because energy is being stored inside those substances in the ammonium nitrate water mixture. <clears throat> now work is the second way in which energy is transferred into or out of a system. We can use heat to transfer energy or we can use work. Work is done on the system. For instance, when we compress a gas, it transfers energy to the system. So the delta U is indeed positive. Its molecules are increasing in speed. They're moving faster. They're colliding more frequently with the walls of a container if it's a contained system. Now work done by the system 
when, for instance, a gas expands, uses the internal energy of those molecules to do the work. So delta U is in fact negative in this case. Energy is being used to do useful work by the system on the surroundings. Now in thermodynamics, pressure volume work commonly occurs when a gas is compressed or expanded under the influence of outside or exterior pressure. Now let's look at this particular system here. We have a gas that's in this container here. And this gas is being heated. And as the gas heats up, it expands. And as it expands, it pushes, does work on this piston. So energy is transferred to the system by the heat. The system again are these molecules inside here. The gas molecules just make up the system, speed up and hit that piston harder. The external pressure now, the internal pressure is greater than the external pressure, so it starts to increase in size. The piston moves up against that external pressure. Now, is work being done on the system or by the system? Think about it for a minute. The molecules are pushing on that piston. They're winning this battle, so they must be done by the system. Now, is the value of the work done positive or negative? Well, what's happening to the internal energy of those molecules? Are the molecules moving faster or slower? Well, they're moving slower because they use some of their energy to push that piston up. So the value of work must be negative because internal energy was being lost by those molecules. Now, will the work cause internal energy of the system U to increase, decrease? Will delta U be positive or negative? What do you think? Well, the internal energy will decrease because the, as the gas expands, the molecules move slower. So the delta H is negative. Does the amount of work done <clears throat> required by the system from one thermodynamic state to the other depend on the path used to make the change? Yes, it depends on the path. It's not a state function. So there's various ways of applying this. We could do it really quickly or we could do it incrementally, very, very slowly and both would result in different quantities of heat involved. Is the value of heat negative or positive? Will this cause delta U to be negative or positive? Think about it. Well, the heat is positive since it's entering the system. The internal energy change will be positive. First law of thermodynamics. Usually it's stated by this, equation here. Internal energy, delta U, can be changed by looking at two forms of energy, heat and work. Delta U, again, is a state function. It's independent of path, whereas Q and W are non-state functions. They depend on the path. Now, Q is positive if heat is added to the system. It's endothermic. Q is negative if heat is removed from the system. It's exothermic. W is positive if the work done on the system is by the surroundings. You're doing work on the system. Now, this results in a volume decrease. So if you take a gas and put work on it, you're squishing it, <clears throat> you're doing work, you're gonna decrease the volume. So that type of work is negative because the system does work on the surroundings. If, if I take that gas and expand it, that gas is doing work on the system. That gas, the system is doing work on the surroundings. So the energy of those particles are, as it expands, will be decreasing. And the volume increases at the expense of the energy that came from those molecules. That work, again, is negative. Now I'm going to talk about a special state function that was created. It was called enthalpy. Now enthalpy is defined as the change in internal energy plus pressure volume changes. Now it was specifically defined so that the change in enthalpy equals the amount of heat at constant pressure. Because most reactions that are done in the real world are done at con constant pressure. That constant pressure being the calorimeter. Think of the coffee cup calorimeters that you used in experimentation. 
the external pressure is air pressure. The air pressure doesn't change during the course of the, re of the actual experiment. So, so delta H was defined as the amount of heat that is transferred under a constant pressure of the atmosphere. Very convenient quantity. And it allows us to do experiments where we can capture that, that heat using calorimetry. <clears throat> now, the pressure, again, as I said, has to be held constant. So now, enthalpy change equals delta U. But remember, delta U is the sum total of the heat transferred and the work being done. Now, the work is not being done by the system in this case. We have the pressure of the system and we're multiplying it by the volume. So what you're gonna now do is simply figure out the amount of work. The work done was the minus pressure external times delta V, which we just showed you how to calculate. And the pressure of the system, if it's equal to the external pressure, which in most chemical um, experiments that are done inside labs, the external pressure and the system pressure are the same. The system pressure is the pressure inside that chemical system, inside that coffee cup calorimeter, if you may. So now, <clears throat> since the negative external pressure times delta V equals the positive P external pressure times delta V, we can simply eliminate those two terms. They cancel each other out. So when the system is at constant pressure, we can simply say the enthalpy change, delta H, that defined state function, is really a measure of the heat that was either absorbed or released under constant pressure. Now, this state function <clears throat> is equal to a non-state function simply because you have identified what the path is. The path is constant pressure. Just like I used the analogy in a previous slide showing the skiers on the ski hill. How could you make the distance traveled equal to the elevation change? By defining the path. The path is you have to take that chairlift up. There's no other way. And so the elevation change will be the same as the distance traveled. However, if I have the other situation happening where we're coming down that mountain, that's path dependent when you calculate the distance. Now in this case, delta H is always equal to NCP delta T. Notice there are two state functions here. The state function of delta H and the state function of delta T. Whenever you have state functions for both, it means that it's path independent, which means that this formula will work for systems if the pressure is constant, if the volume is constant, and if neither pressure or volume are constant, we can calculate enthalpy change using NCP delta T, where CP really is just the amount of heat it takes to heat up the gas. And you're given the value of CP for any question that you're asked to solve. Now, we can also calculate delta H. If the pressure remains constant externally, and the internal pressure and external pressure are equal, we can also calculate delta H when it equals QP. And again, because it's a state function equal to a non-state function, you have to specify the path. And what is that path? The path is a constant pressure. So that equation again can be used even if the pressure is not constant, if the volume is constant, if neither of them are constant. It can be used in any of those scenarios with gases that are basically being expanded, contracted, heated, or cooled. Now, let's emphasize above, we noted that the internal energy, the change in internal energy is equal to QV, the amount of heat at constant volume. And think about that for a second. If you have a gas that's at constant volume and you add heat to it, all that heat is going to go into the internal energy of the molecules. It can't go into expanding the volume of the container. So it has no other place to go. Now, delta U can also equal NCV delta T. Now, again, both of these depend on 
whether they're physical or chemical changes. And again, if we have two state functions, we can use this, use this equation. Uh, again, because there's none, the state functions are, there's one on each side of the equation. We can use it for a variety of situations. Uh, for gases, like I said, being expanded, contracted. Now, therefore, the internal energy of a system, the change in it, is equal to QV if there is no chemical reaction or not. When the volume is held constant, we're defining what the path is. Again, only one state function. So we have to stipulate what the path is, just like those skiers going up the hill. If we want to have the elevation change in the distance, the same then we have to establish that you are going up on that chairlift. There's no other way up. You're gonna have the same distance covered and the same elevation change. Now, also delta U is always equal to NCV delta T for a one component system, which we're gonna study quite a bit. A one component system is a monatomic gas in most instances, a monatomic ideal gas, and it's not undergoing any kind of physical or chemical change. So you're not getting involved in the bond breaking or bond making, whether they between be uh, between the particles. In this case, it's a monoatomic gas. There's no bonds inside the molecules, just between the molecules. So whether volume is constant or not, delta U is a state function. Now, delta H is equal to QP if there's a chemical reaction or not. That's because the heat energy is going to be captured when the pressure is constant. Now, delta H is always equal to NCP de delta T for a one component system that's not undergoing any kind of physical or chemical change. So no phase changes, okay? No chemical reactions. And this depends, this is determined by, again, whether pressure is constant or not, since delta H is a state function. Now, here's a summary of all the equations that you used. I want to remind you that you'll be given these equations for every evaluation that we do. We've been summarizing these, and I'm going to talk a bit about the monatomic gases in a minute. Okay? For these monatomic gases, we know that the specific heat capacity of a monatomic gas under constant pressure is always greater than the specific heat capacity of that gas at a constant volume. And why is that? Well, think about it. When we add heat to a system at a constant volume, all that heat is going into the molecules of gas. The volume can't expand. So the volume remains constant. So the energy is all going into those molecules. Well, it doesn't take as much heat energy to increase the temperature of that system because all the energy is going into the molecules. Now let's compare that to a system that has a constant pressure. If we have a gas that's at a constant pressure and we add heat to it, some of that energy is gonna go into expanding that gas. And some of that energy is gonna go into the actual kinetic energy of those molecules. So it takes more heat energy to heat up a gas at a constant pressure than it does to heat up a gas at a constant volume. And C really is a measure of how much energy it takes to increase the temperature of a substance by one degree Celsius. And specific heat capacities are typically given to us. Every substance has its own unique specific heat capacity. Now for monatomic gases, which are things like helium, argon, krypton, all the noble gases, we know the relationship. Cp equals Cv plus R and Cv equals three halves R, so Cp equals five halves R. You can, you can determine if I'm given Cp and I'm given R, I could find Cv. Similarly, if I'm given Cv and I'm asked to find Cp, I need R. Well, you're always given R. So given one Cp, you can find Cv. Given Cv, you can find Cp using this relationship again, which is on your information sheets. Now let's talk about the sample problem we're going to be solving here. So a sample of solid benzoic acid that has a mass of 0.8 grams is burned in an excess of oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide gas and liquid water in a constant volume calorimeter. 
at 25 degrees Celsius. The temperature rise is observed to be 2.15 Kelvin. The heat capacity of the calorimeter and its contents are known to be 9,382 joules per Kelvin. So notice this unit is, is interesting. All we need is the temperature change or the temperature to figure out what, how much energy was, was um, absorbed by this calorimeter. Okay, and we're given the temperature change here, 2.15 Kelvin. We also need to balance this chemical equation. So what I would ask you to do really is to right now pause the video and try the question on your own. I implore you to try things on your own. You don't really learn by watching me do it. You learn by doing it yourself. This is a participation activity. You have to participate here. So shut me off and solve this problem. Okay, now first thing I'm gonna do is balance the equation. It tells us this is benzoic acid, which is a benzene ring attached to a carboxylic acid. It's a ring structure with six carbons and five hydrogens. And the sixth carbon is a carboxylic acid attached to it. So it's a C double bond OOH. We write it this way to, to uh, make it simpler, all right? I know it's an acid, so that's there's the hydrogen that's released from the acid. So balance the equation, okay? And here are the different questions we're gonna be answering. So we're gonna calculate the standard change in internal energy for the combustion of benzoic acid at this temperature. We're gonna calculate the standard change in internal energy per mole of benzoic acid. We're gonna calculate the standard enthalpy change per mole of benzoic acid. Notice the answers are given so you can practice them, okay? Now I'm gonna highlight the things that are really important here that you should be focused on as we move forward. So when I balance this equation, I can see the reactants are oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. Please remember to put the symbols down because they become very important later on. So we have a solid combining with a gas and notice there's six, Moles, I'm going to think about this as moles of carbon. So if there's six here and one there is seven, there's seven moles of carbon. How do I balance carbon here? By putting a seven in front of the CO2. And now once I've balanced, I like to put a check mark over the carbon, over the carbon to make sure we, we know the carbon is being balanced. When I balance equations, I like to balance substances that are present in the fewest number of places first. Carbon is only in two places. So let's balance it. Notice hydrogen is in two places and oxygen is in three places. So I'm gonna balance oxygen last. Hydrogen I'm gonna balance next. I can see there's six hydrogens here. So in order to balance hydrogen, what number multiplied by two gives me six? Well, that number is three. So we have three moles of water, liquid water that are gonna be produced in this combustion reaction of benzoic acid. And now the last thing we're gonna balance is oxygen. We can see on the right side of the equation, there's 14 oxygens and seven CO2s. There's three oxygens, so there's 17 oxygens. There's two here, so that takes us down to 15 oxygens we need to add, because 15 and two make 17. Well, one number multiplied by two gives me 15. Well, 15 halves. I like to balance equations where I have one reactant present as one mole. You can get rid of this fraction if you don't like fractions and mul multiply everything by two. So that'd be a two and that'd be a 15, that'd be a 14, that'd be a six. But I find it personally easier to just use one mole for this reactant and use the fraction. I'm perfectly um, comfortable with fractions. Okay, now let's calculate the standard change in internal energy for the combustion of benzoic acid. So let's think about what formula we use for delta U here. So Remember, it says the volume of the container was constant. We know under constant volume, delta U, under constant volume, all the heat is being captured because none of the heat is going into changing the volume of the container. So in this case, delta U is just equal to QV. So, and we know the heat released by the benzoic acid is absorbed by the calorimeter. They will be equal and opposite since the heat released is equal to the heat absorbed. We can use, we can apply that just using signs. So in this case, 
we were told that the calorimeter had a specific heat capacity of 9,382 joules per Kelvin. We were told that the temperature rise was 2.15 Kelvin. So when we multiply those two quantities together, we get the amount of joules involved and hence the change in internal energy for this system. Now I'd also like to change because it becomes a very big number, let's change it into smaller numbers by using kilojoules. And we know one kilojoule is equal to a thousand joules. So when we cancel out these units, we see Kelvin's cancel, we see joules cancel, and we end up with minus 20.2 kilojoules, three significant digits, which coincides with the quantities given in the question, three significant digits, three significant digits. Now we're gonna calculate the standard change in internal energy per mole of benzoic acid. Now this was the amount of heat energy that was released by the combustion, absorbed by the calorimeter, and we can see it's a negative quantity because again, the chemical system lost energy. Its molecules will be moving slower when we're finished because some of the internal energy was taken away by that combustion process, okay? So now, for one mole of benzoic acid, we know a mole of benzoic acid is 122.0 grams. The amount of energy, 20.2 kilojoules, was the amount of energy that was released from 0.8 grams, not from a mole of benzoic acid. A mole of benzoic acid is 122 grams. So we have to multiply, in this case, the 20 minus 20.2 kilojoules we have to multiply it by 122 grams divided by 0.8 grams, which gives us the number of moles of benzoic acid. And there is our answer. Minus 3.8 times 10 to the 3 kilojoules per mole of benzoic acid. Again, three significant digits. The benzoic acid lost heat energy, so it's a negative quantity. Now I'm going to solve for D. Calculate the standard enthalpy change, delta H, per mole of benzoic acid. Okay, and now we're gonna calculate delta, the change in delta U, okay? So delta H is delta U plus delta PV. When you look at this chemical equation, we can see the gases, compare the gas quantities. This chemical system actually had a change in quantity of gas. Well, isn't that gonna affect the internal pressure inside this container if we have more gas? So, or less gas, we have seven and a half moles of gas on the reactant side. We have only seven moles of gas on the product side. So we had a decrease of half a mole of gas. And we know the enthalpy change is delta U plus delta PV. Again, because this particular system had a change in the amount of pressure brought about by the change in gases. And that's why it's so important to put the state of the substance in your equation when calculating delta H. When we perform the calculation, we know PV equals NRT, don't we? So PV, NRT, we substitute for PV, we substitute NRT here. And all we're looking at is a change in the number of moles of gas, and we can see it's 0.5 moles. R is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. Temperature, this was conducted at 25 degrees Celsius, so it was conducted at 298 Kelvin. We changed the joules to kilojoules by multiplying by one kilojoule for 1,000 kilojoules. The joules cancel, the Kelvins cancel, and we're left with kilojoules. So we got a small quantity of energy here brought about by the change in the volume of the system, the system being the benzoic acid, and the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in the water it was in a closed system here, a constant volume calorimeter. And this quantity is quite small compared to the quantity of energy from the actual combustion. So now we get the total enthalpy change by adding those two up. And we can see that when we add them up and use the rules for significant digits, the answer can't have more decimal places than the numbers that we used 
to arrive at it when we're adding them. So we're, when we're adding or subtracting significant digits, we're looking at the number of decimal places, two decimal places, two decimal places, two decimal places. So for all intents and purposes, there was very little impact on the energy, on the enthalpy change for this reaction because the change in volume of gas was very, very small. Well, I thank you very much for participating with me and we'll see you next time. Take care.